Well, good morning, church. It's good to be here with you this morning. Uh, as we begin, I want to do something we haven't done here in a very long time, something that makes uh, extroverts very excited, something that makes introverts internally grumble. I want people to stand and walk around and greet one another this morning. We haven't done that in a long time. Let's do that this morning. <laughs> Oh, I'm trying to. Okay. I turned 30 on Wednesday. That's right. Today I went to the preach last night. Although I went to one one year ago, and the old bishop in the he married my boss and my girlfriend. I thought he was going to be a Okay. Maybe he was going to be a Christian. Or not. And today he was like the scripture from the United States.
four or 55 plus people. And I know that's confusing to hear, but uh, we invite anyone who would like to join us this Wednesday, or I'm sorry, this Friday. Uh, we're going to be uh, dining together, having some dinner together, and then we're going to be taking part in, uh, we're going to do a Jeopardy trivia game. And I've decided we're going to do trivia through the decades. So study up on your trivia of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Uh, and then we're just going to be having a time of worship together. Uh, we're going to be throwing it back to uh, the first hymn sing here at Cole Rain. Uh, Blake and I are going to be leading a cappella hymns. I apologize ahead of time for anyone who accidentally hears my voice at any point during the a cappella hymns. Uh, so we look forward to that. Again, that's this coming Friday at 5.55 at Wesley Main. For anyone who is 55 plus, we invite you to join us. And then just uh, one additional announcement. Uh, this Wednesday at 6 o'clock, uh, we are going to, again, be having prayer night here at Cole Rain, right here in the sanctuary. That's this coming Wednesday. And then we'll be having our last 5Q for the summer, the following Wednesday, before we break for the summer for 5Q. Uh, so we invite you to join us uh, here at 6 o'clock on this Wednesday for prayer night and following Wednesday for 5Q. Uh, church, as we begin this morning, as we prepare our hearts for worship, would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for all those gathered in this place this morning, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for the constant reminders all throughout the scriptures, particularly in what we have looked at over these last months in Hebrews and now in Joshua, of your continued faithfulness over your people. Lord, I remember going through Hebrews 11, just seeing the faith of your people and looking at the fact that while we remember them for their faith, each person listed there was still fundamentally flawed, in some way sinful. And that it was a reminder through and through that in spite of our separation from you, you are still a faithful and good God. You are the good, good Father who waits in anticipation looking out the window for us to come home to you, constantly beckoning us back to the love of a Father who desperately wants relationship with us. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness to the Israelite people, the example that is for us today. And Father, be with us as we continue to dig into Joshua, we continue to see your faithfulness to your people, we continue to see what it looks like for them to walk in faith, and by extension, what it looks like for us today to continue to walk in faith in light of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Lord, right now, we prepare our hearts to come to the throne of grace and worship. We invite your Holy Spirit into this place. We know it's here. Where two or three are gathered, you are there with them. But Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to light a fire in this place right now. That we would feel your spirit in a very real way. That we would have that spirit of expectation that the spirit of God is not only going to just move in this place. This is just a building, but he is going to move in our midst and in our hearts because the spirit of God resides with us. Lord, be with us now as we worship. Be with us now. Open our hearts and minds as we prepare to dig into your scriptures. We want more of you, Jesus. Every single moment we want more of you. Be with us now as we worship. We pray all these things. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Let's all stand. There's grace. 
down to fill our hearts and our minds. Let's be open in order for him to pour himself into us this morning. So Lord, come Jesus, come. Wash over this place, God. Let us be receptive of who you are. Because you're worthy of all praise. Thank you, Jesus.
you've made a way to meet us where we are. And you're worthy. You're worthy. So come to us this morning, God. Open our hearts and our minds to see your true and living word. Words of truth, words of life. Church, over the last several weeks, uh, we have embarked on this journey of looking at the book of Joshua together, and thus far, just in the last two weeks alone, we have looked at the first two chapters of, of Joshua, and in the first two chapters alone, we get two incredi incredibly big and pivotal moments in the history of the Israelite people. We have seen not only the commissioning of Joshua, remember, I mean, this, this is a big deal. When someone has led and led well for 40 plus years, a transition to a new leader is a massive moment in a nation's history. We have seen just that with the commissioning of Joshua in chapter 1. And we have also seen an example uh, from Rahab. She has told the Israelite people that the spirit of all those within Jericho uh, they melt away when they see what the God of the Israelites has done and is continuing to do for them. There is no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath, is what Rahab said to the spies last week, as we saw in Joshua chapter 2. And they are given the least likely ally within the walls of Jericho, in Rahab, one who is redeemed by God to make a way for the Israelites to claim the land he was giving over to them. And this morning, we will see now uh, some more continued movement towards the promised land. After 40 years of wandering, and as we looked at in Joshua chapter 1, a few days of waiting, uh, Joshua says to wait at least three days, we'll finally see in Joshua chapter 3 movement towards what the Israelites have been waiting for. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 3. We are going to again be looking at the entire chapter together this morning. So again, Joshua chapter 3. And again, we're going to see movement towards the land promised to the Israelite people here. Joshua chapter 3, Joshua writes this. Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan. He and all the people of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, this referring to the three days of waiting before they moved, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet, there should be a distance between you and the Ark, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel. That they may know that just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over you, before, uh, is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore, take twelve men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. 
So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan, with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, and this is important, this is likely in parentheses in your Bible, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarephan. And those flowing down toward the Sea of the Arabath, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. As I said a moment ago, we have already, in Joshua chapter 1 and Joshua chapter 2, you've seen two incredibly massive, monumental, historical events take place for Israel, and chapter 3 does not slow down that momentum in any way, shape, or form. It has been 40 years since Israel left Egypt, since they departed Egypt, walking through the Red Sea together as one nation on dry ground and wandered throughout the wilderness and throughout their struggles while uh, living in the wilderness together. We have seen throughout the book of the law, throughout the first five books of the Bible penned by Moses, we have seen a lot of ups and downs in the Israelite people. We have seen them waver and fall many times. We have seen moments where they fully and completely trust God. We have seen moments where literally weeks after that trust, they are looking to idols and to the things of this world. We have seen the people of Israel rally around one another and lift one another up. And we have seen them in contention with one another. The Israelite nation shows throughout the first five books of the Bible just the, the fickleness of human beings. How quickly we can ebb and flow. So much has happened for them over these last 40 years. But the beginning of Joshua, what we are seeing here in the first several chapters of Joshua, show us very sure signs that the Israelites are finally ready to enter into the land that has been promised to them. Joshua has been commissioned and emboldened by the Lord. Rahab has informed them that the inhabitants of Jericho melt away before what their God has done. And now the only thing seemingly standing in their way is just as it was when they departed Egypt, a body of water yet again. The Jordan River stands before them. We see them at the end of these, uh, these last three days of waiting before they move, and the first command is given before they move in, starting uh, in verse 3, looking at verse 4. Joshua commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet, there shall be a distance between you and the Ark, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. The first noticeable thing we see here as they make these final preparations to enter into the promised land is that very clearly the ark has to lead the way. Once and only once, they could see the priests carrying the ark. They were not to set out before they saw the ark. Only once they saw the priests in the distance carrying the ark were they told, then you should set out and follow after. And they are given a strict command from God to not only follow the ark, to go after only you have seen it in the distance, but they're given an exact distance that they should stay. I mean, church, the nation of Israel, we're talking about a lot of people that are going to be following after these priests. It's why the command for 2,000 cubits is given here. And if you're like me, uh, the phrase 2,000 cubits means nothing to you, so we can go a little bit more in depth than that. Uh, one cubit is roughly 18 inches, so one and a half feet. And so they are told to stay 3,000 feet behind the ark at all times. That's just a little over a quarter of a mile. For our staff people, that's 0.83 of a mile. Uh, the, and so we're to, looking at the length of 10 American football fields laid end over end is the distance they are to keep 
behind the ark. And church, I believe that this is commanded of the Israelite people for two very clear reasons. First and foremost, the distance they are keeping is a way of showing clear reverence for what the ark symbolizes. This was an indication for not only Israel as a nation, but for anyone around them who, who might witness and see this whole nation of people who has wandered homeless for 40 years following after the Ark of the Covenant. It is a, a symbol for any who might see that the presence of the Lord not only resided with Israel, but it led Israel. The Ark was built first and foremost as a place for God to literally reside when the ark sat in the Holy of Holies, the, the part of the tabernacle that the great high priest could only enter once per year. I'm sorry, the high priest could enter once per year. And the Spirit of God would literally be hovering over the mercy seat of the ark between the extended wings of the cherubim on its lid. And this God did not have the ark created to just sit in the Holy of Holies, the physical representation of his presence would be carried with his people, would be carried in the front of his people as he led them. Secondly, the ark went ahead of the people and so far ahead of the people, almost one mile in fact, so that all of the people of Israel would be able to move together with their eyes fixed on God alone. It's why that command is given. Do not move from your place until you can physically see the ark moving ahead of you. That the people of Israel, as they uh, walked into this, uh, again, massive change, they are, this walk is a physical walk, but think about what it symbolizes as well. As they draw closer to what God has promised for them, this, this is also symbolic of the fact that they are going from being wanderers in a strange nation in the wilderness to walking into being an established nation with land that they could call their own as it was promised to Abraham in Genesis. And they would keep their eyes completely and solely fixed on this physical rep representation of the presence of God for them. Even the very contents of the ark would, would remind them, would be a symbol as they looked at the ark, as they were reminded of the presence of God, what resided within the ark would cause them to reflect on and look back on God being with them through the last 40 years. If you were to find the ark of the covenant today and open it up, you would find the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, you would find a jar of manna, a representation of how God provided for his people in the wilderness. And you would find Aaron's staff that had budded flowers. The Israelites have been through so much as represented by the contents of the ark. And by keeping their eyes fixated on it was, I believe, God's way of saying to them as they entered into this new period in their time as a nation Look what I have brought you through already. Look at how closely I have walked with you. That I have spoken to you directly through Moses and now through Joshua. He has established his word and his covenant with them. And now, by following the ark alone, was God's way of calling the Israelites to trust in him completely and fully. And church, God does not call us to trust him and to follow him blindly. He implores us all throughout the scriptures, as it says in Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. To know God and to follow after him is to know his encouragement in your life as well. And that's the second thing I want us to see from Joshua chapter 3 this morning. Uh, Israel is, is walking and making their way towards something that is clearly for them. God has told them very clearly that this land is promised to them. This is their land. But they are walking into another situation in which they do not have all the answers. 
They are moving toward the land promised to them, but the Jordan River still stands between them, not in a season of drought, as Joshua makes it very clear, but rather in a season where the Jordan would be rushing at its highest and most intense. And God has not yet made it very clear how the people are going to cross, but there is a, a, a moving in faith towards what God has for them, even if they don't have the complete picture of how they're going to get there, they trust in God enough to move towards what he has for them. And we see Joshua encouraged by the Lord to continue moving in faith and to actively encourage his people for what is to come. Starting in verse 7, the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel. That they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. As for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters in the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. God tells them there in verse 8 what to do. He doesn't tell them what's going to happen as a result of what is done. And in verse 9, Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. Church, I believe so many today are, are still stuck in a loop of believing and thinking of God as uh, someone who watches over us with a watchful eye simply to see when we slip up, when we do bad, when we sin. And that one day when we are standing before the judgment seat of God, uh, he's going to be sitting there with a scale with our good and bad weighed on it. And if one outweighs the other, that will determine where we go. That is not who our God is. That is not how he operates. And it's never been how he operates. Time and time again, God shows us throughout the scriptures that he is a God of encouragement. He is a God who not only encourages us, but he walks along with us in those moments where our own bravery or our own boldness may wane. They don't know yet what it's going to look like to cross the Jordan, but the Israelites here are told in verse 8, have the priests stand on the brink of the waters. Those first few steps into the rushing waters of the Jordan, and he doesn't tell them what's going to happen. He simply tells them what they are to do and that he is going to be with them. But this comes at a time of great encouragement for Joshua. Just as God was with Moses, and think of what God had done in and through Moses through his years as the leader of the Israelites, and he's saying to Joshua, just as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you, Joshua. Every step of the way, he's going to be with Joshua, and by extension, he is going to be with the people of Israel. Church, if we are actively seeking after God in our own lives, and uh, not only in that way of, of seeking forgiveness when we slip up or when we fail, but uh, desiring him in all moments of our lives, I want you to know that uh, he is beckoning you and desires that you aren't just going to come to him when things get difficult. You aren't just going to come to God when you feel like you're slipping up or when you feel like your life is in disarray. He wants to encourage you and build you up in all moments. Even when it feels like things are going really well, we should continue to seek after God and hear his encouragement in our lives. Because there's going to be seasons where maybe things are going well and he's called us into uh, something new, something that's going to be challenging, something that's going to stretch us. And he wants us to know that if we're following him, he is with us and will encourage us in those seasons when we're walking through changes that maybe he has called us into. Our God at times, contrary to that very popular quote we hear all too often, our God is going to give us more than we personally can handle sometimes because he wants us to lean into him, into his strength, into his power. He wants us to be encouraged by knowing that he's never going to give us more than he could handle. Amen. And through the encouragement and the clear command from God, we see the faithfulness of God here with the Israelites. Just as the waters, when Moses stepped in and planted his staff in the Red Sea, as they were departing the bondage of Egypt, just as that happened, again, 
the leaders of Israel will walk into a body of water. And that water will split or stop again. We don't get a very extremely clear picture of just what this looks like. But regardless, the waters are halted. And the people of Israel move towards what God has for them on dry land. Verse 14. When the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant for the people. And as soon as those bearing the Ark had come, had come as far as the Jordan... And the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarephim. And those flowing down toward the Sea of the Arabah and the Salt Sea were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until the nation finished passing over the Jordan. The miracle of them again for the second time crossing a major body of water on dry land is so significant. It should stick out to us as uh, an extension and a reminder of what happened at the Red Sea. But the focus of this entire chapter, as incredible as the crossing of the Jordan is, the focus of this entire chapter, if we read through it and we're diligent to pay attention, see how many times the phrase Ark of the Covenant is repeated over and over and over again throughout chapter 3. The Ark of the Covenant is there in the midst of the river. It says the priests that were there with it were standing, standing firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And the people are passing by it and observing the very presence of God, this physical reminder of the presence of God with them as they again, and remember, many of these people crossing over the Jordan have only heard the story of their parents and grandparents crossing over the Red Sea on dry land, and now they themselves are walking past the Ark of the Covenant on dry ground at the Jordan River. Church, Israel was only there crossing on dry land because they not only heard the encouragement from the Lord that was given to Joshua for them, but they followed his command for them. They stepped out in faith, and those priests took that first step of faith for the nation of Israel into the rushing waters of the Jordan River. God did not tell them, stand at the bank of the Jordan River, stand on the dry ground, and then watch and wait and see what happens. He told the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant, take those first steps into the brink of the river in the middle of its flooding season. He asked them to step into a situation that would appear to be dangerous and was dangerous, yet because of their faithfulness to take that first literal step in faith, again, a symbol that this nation is ready for its promise of a nation to be fulfilled, these priests would take this first step and when they do, God again shows up in a very real way, exactly as he did with Moses when his staff was plunged into the Red Sea. And we don't know exactly how, but it says that the waters far up the river were cut off completely, that no water came down, and that soon, whether it was a matter of moments whether it was a matter of hours as they stood there and waited on the Lord, eventually the land in front of them stops running with water and is dry. Where there was once river, there is nothing so that they can continue to press on to what God had for them. This is, again, another incredible and beautiful moment in the history of the Israelite people. And this image of the Ark of the Covenant in the midst of the people on dry land, as the people continue to press on towards the promised land, it points us to how Jesus fulfills 
in a far more perfect way what the ark was meant to show us about the identity of God. Church, I referenced earlier, if you were to find the Ark of the Covenant today and, and, and lift it, you would find what the contents were in it. The Ark of the Covenant is gone. Uh, regardless of uh, what the Indiana Jones movie may, may, movies may lead us to believe, it is gone. It hasn't been found in centuries. And I remember as, uh, as a high school student, as I started to study in the Bible, I, I became a little bit infatuated with the Ark of the Covenant. Where is it? Where is it? I want to see the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. I want to see Aaron's staff. I want to see this jar. And as I've gotten older, as, I, as I've continued to look at the Ark of the Covenant, my stance has changed to it's gone. Good. Let it be gone. Because we now have the person of Jesus who shows us exactly what the ark was meant to show us about God, but in a much more complete and a much more beautiful way. Jesus is what the ark was in its purest form. The presence of God taking on a physical form, but instead of a box, he took on flesh and blood, and he became man and dwelt among us. That unlike this inanimate ark, unlike this inanimate box, he might know our struggles. He might know our temptations. And unlike the ark, he might make a way where there was no way. That's what he does. And it's what the ark does for them here. It's what the presence of God does for Israel. It makes a way physically where there was no way before. I love that Joshua, as they realize that the Jordan River is the only thing that stands in their way, doesn't first, uh, he doesn't consult with their engineers, he doesn't uh, consult with uh, their navigators to see where they might go to get around it. He looks first and foremost to God. And the ark, the presence of God, makes a way physically where there was no way before. Jesus makes a way spiritually for us where there was no way before. To return to a father who desires relationship with us and loves us fully. Just as the ark once symbolized for the Israelite people, Jesus now shows us that the presence of God is with us. And not just in moments, not just in those, those brief glimpses where uh, the, the, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies or where the ark would lead uh, the, the people of Israel into the promised land. The presence of God no longer hovers on the mercy seat of the ark in the Holy of Holies. The presence of God result, uh, resides in the heart of believers through the Spirit of God given to us. Because of Jesus... We no longer need uh, that, that physical thing, that physical symbol that we could look at to show us that the presence of God is with us because of Jesus, because of the gift of the Holy Spirit as we see it come upon believers in Acts chapter 2. We can now be assured and know in all things, both easy things and difficult things, that God resides with us through his Holy Spirit. Church, this morning, we can know that not only is God with us, but there are going to be times that just like he does for the Israelites here in Joshua chapter 3, there are going to be times and seasons where he calls us to take that first step. And it's not often going to be a comfortable step to take. It's not going to often be a first step onto dry and solid ground. It might be a step into, uh, into rushing waters. But he calls us into those seasons with reminders that he goes with us. He is a God of encouragement. He is a God who wants us to seek after him, to seek after his word. I go back to that that first command, one of the first commands for Joshua uh, in Joshua chapter 1 is that the word of the Lord be careful to do according to the, all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. And he says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall med meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. 
God wants us to seek after him in word and in deed so that we will find that he truly is a God of encouragement. He is a God who keeps his promises and church. He is a God who knows what we need far better than we ever could know what we need. Taste and see that the Lord is good, Psalm 34 says. And we see this all throughout the Old Testament. Think of all the ways the Israelites have wavered over the last 40 plus years in the wilderness. And now the presence of God goes before them as they cross the Jordan River towards what God has laid aside for them. That is the God that he is. He is a God of encouragement. He is a God who builds us up for what he has for us if we are diligent to seek him. That is who our God is. As Patrick comes, as we prepare, close the worship this morning, would you pray with me? God of heaven and earth, I thank you that you are a God of encouragement. You are a God who still goes before and leads your people. Lord, help us to follow after you in everything we do. Help us keep our eyes, we no longer have to keep our eyes fixed on, on a physical representation. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Help us keep our eyes fixed on the way he has fulfilled and perfected what the Ark of the Covenant was only beginning to show the Israelite people about who you are. That through him, we not only have a way back to you, but we get a more complete picture of just how much you desire a relationship with us. Lord, I thank you that the Spirit of God no longer hovers over the mercy seat of the physical box. It resides in the heart of believers. Help us to look to the Spirit in all things, in all seasons, when things are going well or when it feels like our world is falling apart. Help us to look to the Spirit of God, that it would encourage us and build us up, that it would cause us in all moments to look to you and you alone and not to the things of this world. Lord God, I thank you for the faithfulness and the example of the Israelite people to follow after you and the faithfulness of the priests to take that first step into the rushing waters of the Jordan. Lord, in the season when you're calling us into much the same, help us to be bold in our faith to take those first steps. Help us to be bold to look to you and know that you will never leave us or forsake us. Help us each and every day to taste and see that the Lord of God is indeed good. We love you so much, Jesus. We pray all these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, our God parts waters, amen. Amen. I'm thankful that we have Jesus this morning. I'm thankful that he meets us right where we are. And I'm thankful for the moments when we can just be still and we can just trust in his goodness, in his plan. A lot of times... It's not any fancy prayer or anything, but all I say is this, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. And you know what? He does. He does. He's the best leader. The best leader. And so there's moments when I find that his spirit really moves. In a simple prayer like that. Help me, Jesus. And he parts the waters, doesn't he? That's who he is. Let's all stand together. As we continue to trust Him, continue to turn our hearts and our minds to Him, and we worship Him this morning, and we cry out, Great are You, Lord. You've parted my waters, God. You've made a way in the wilderness, God. Where we didn't see any way through, He makes a way through.
Be strong and courageous. This is the third time God is giving that encouragement. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I, I talk pretty frequently about how we have to be careful about taking the commands and promises of the, the Old Testament for the Israelite people and automatically assuming that all of them are for us as well. The church, this still applies to us today. The Lord your God, if you know Jesus as your Savior, is with you wherever you go. Therefore, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. He holds you in the palm of his hand. He is a God of encouragement. He is a God who goes before. And He is a God who makes a way. So again, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are a God who makes a way where there is no way. You go before us. You just as the ark went ahead of the Israelites, you go before us, but you also go behind us. We don't. The Israelites didn't have to turn back. We don't have to turn back to what we're walking away from. But Lord, you also go beside us, reminding us each and every moment that the presence of the living God resides with us and goes with us into everything we walk through. Knowing these things about you, Lord Jesus, Help us to go and be bold in a world that so desperately needs the truth of your gospel. Church, as you go this morning, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed. The Lord your God is with you. Go and have a great week in the Lord, church.